We are all familiar with the concept of Birkeland Currents. If you are not, I suggest you start by reviewing the Understanding Birkeland Currents video. Don Scott has revived an old concept of Bessel Function Birkeland Currents, which is both elegant and complex. So I felt it was high time to explain how this model works and examine what the current limitations of the model are and where future work needs to be directed to continue this work. In a follow-up video, I also want to examine strong evidence of the existence of Bessel function filaments throughout the universe. So let's examine Don Scott's Bessel function Birkeland currents. The mechanism by which a moving charge affects its neighbouring charges magnetically is called the Lorentz force. If all these Lorentz forces can be reduced to a zero value throughout the plasma, then the overall flow of the current will continue unaffected. If the overall magnetic field points in the same direction as the travel of the current, then these potentially disruptive Lorentz forces within the plasma will be eliminated and it will be considered a force-free current or a field-aligned current. There are some important aspects that may not be obvious from examining a force-free current. In this model, the charges will flow along the magnetic field lines. Positive charges will flow in one direction and negative charges will flow in the opposite direction. These will tend to take on a helical structure when observed in the laboratory. We see this same structure mimicked in the structures observed in the cosmos. Regardless of the scale, the motion of the charged particles produces a self-magnetic field that can act on the other collection of particles or plasmas, internally or externally. Beams will tend to self-organise through the Bennett pinch or Z pinch effect. This stops them from dispersing. There is a critical current density at which this occurs. If the current density rises too quickly, this can act to squeeze the whole beam into a much smaller space. Lundqvist first came up with a concept of a Bessel function applied to a Birkeland current in the 1950s. There it would sit for well over 50 years until Don Scott dusted it off and added a much needed deep analysis to this concept. Don Scott's leap was to take this concept and express the combination of the magnetic and the electric current density using the Bessel function. Don goes into a lot more detail in his two papers which are linked below. The effect of the Bessel function is that the magnetic field and the current density will vary according to the Bessel function. We will examine the structure of a Birkeland current using this model and there are some important points to realise. Firstly, when we examine the magnetic field it is clear that it is at its strongest along the central axis. We can examine the magnetic field based on its two components which are at right angles to each other. The sum of these two creates the overall magnetic field at that point. The two components we are interested in are the forward direction along the axis of rotation and at 90 degrees to this moving out along the radius orbiting around the central axis. This is referred to as the azimuthal component. As we increase the size of one, the other must decrease. This means that it is possible to have a magnetic field that is only axial or that is only azimuthal. At the centre, the magnetic field points directly along the axis, so there is no azimuthal component. As we move further out, the axial component reduces and the azimuthal component increases until you reach a point that the azimuthal component is at maximum and the axial is at zero. From here the field starts to reverse and now the axial component will start to get stronger in the backwards direction until we get to a point that the backwards axial component is at a maximum and the azimuthal is at a minimum. This continues until we reach a point that the axial once again returns to a maximum in the forward direction. A similar thing happens to the current density. This means that at the centre the current will flow into the screen along the z-axis. As we move further and further out, the direction will become increasingly azimuthal until a point is reached where the current no longer travels in the forward direction, but instead orbits around the central axis. As we continue to move further out from the central axis, 
Now the axial component will start to increase in the backwards direction, meaning that the overall magnetic field will start to point backwards. As we move further and further out, this will continue until the axial component is once again at a maximum, but this time pointing in the opposite direction, so pointing back at us, out of the screen. Now if we continue to go further, we will see the same thing happening, but now it will start to point in the forward direction. And again, if we continue far enough out, we will see that it once again reaches a point at which the axial component is maximum, so the current will travel in the forward direction only. And this process repeats over and over again. The important point to realize is that you end up with a certain number of shells. And these shells will either travel in the forward direction or will end up being an orbit around the central axis. So some of the shells move forward, some of the shells move backwards, and some of the shells rotate in one direction, and some of the shells rotate in the other direction. And this is where we see the classic counter-rotating shells that we often talk about in the Bessel function model. It is a result of these magnetic fields interplaying with each other. Now one important point to note is that when you move further and further out, the strength of both the magnetic and the current density will decrease. This means that although some of the current is flowing backwards, the majority is still moving in the forward direction. What is not defined as part of this model is the boundary condition. And by this I mean how far out does this Bessel function continue? In Don's paper he includes some images from Peratt's work, which show some of the finer detail and clearly show material being drawn out and in towards different shells. Sadly, Don doesn't discuss any of the details of the experiment other than showing the picture. The reason that it is important to have a boundary condition is that if you don't, it implies that it just continues at a very much slower rate, so there isn't a clear edge to any of these. And the problem is when we examine them, you know, the filaments that we see in space, we do see that clear edge and that clear boundary. And when we examine the work of Pratt, again, you could argue it's in a laboratory, so maybe it's not exactly the same condition, but there is a clear edge to this. Now, what would be interesting to know is if they detected a backwards flow in Pratt's work, in the Birkeland current that he generated, was there any backwards flow that Don had predicted? And could this help us to define that outer edge of the Birkeland current? And if it is variable or if it is static, does it change or does it not change? Now, by examining Peratt's book of the physics of the plasma universe, it can be seen that this image, the image that Don uses, is taken from a dense plasma focus device, similar to the ones that I've covered that were used by Eric Lerner and Bostic. Now in Peratt's book he discusses the formation of a field aligned current and shows how a hollow cylinder of plasma fired from the machine will form a series of smaller filaments first, around 56, which then merge to fewer and fewer, eventually forming just four filaments. Now this implies that the image used is a transient effect, and this image clearly shows the concept of material moving to different shells but Peratt's book implies that this is not a stable state. Both Alvin and Peratt allude to the fact that the current can indeed reverse within a Birkeland current if the current is large enough. It is important to note that they do not employ a Bessel function model in their models, so an extrapolation would be that the size of the current would affect the width and therefore the number of reversals in Don's model. But at the moment, there is no end condition specified by Dunn or any relationship to the current density as to the width of these. Another important point to note is that in general, when we observe filamentation, it tends to occur in pairs or multiple pairs, both in the laboratory and out in space. We see examples in space, for example, the, the double helix nebula. So the question would be, how would a Bessel function form into these twisting filaments? Because Don's model covers just the formation of a single tube, and it is important to remember that due to the Lorentz force of the whole filament, there will naturally be an attraction of the filament towards each other. 
Equally, there will be a repulsive force due to the charges in the filament. And this means that there will be a distance at which an equilibrium is reached and the two filaments will tend to remain at that fixed distance from each other. And this distance to some extent will depend on the width and the current density. So let's go back and consider a plasma cloud somewhere deep in space. Let's assume no other forces are acting upon it. Within the plasma, the particles are free to move in whatever direction they please. As each particle starts to move, it will create its own Lorentz force through the movement. This in turn will have an effect on the neighbouring particles, and these will naturally want to configure themselves into the lowest possible energy state. This means that they will attempt to align themselves with the sum of the magnetic fields in their vicinity. These are created by the motion of all the particles in the vicinity. They will adopt a force-free alignment and create a force-free current. This means that when we sum the Lorentz force anywhere in the structure, it will be equal to zero. Field-aligned force-free currents represent the lowest state of stored magnetic energy attainable in a cosmic current. Once the structure is set up, it is important to realize that at any point in the filament, the magnetic field is never zero, but always consists of a component in the axial and a component in the azimuthal direction. Once you move far enough away from the filament edge, the overall magnetic field would once more take on the appearance of a current carrying wire, and it would drop off accordingly. Now one major problem with this model is that it only maps out the current flow for one type of charge. In all his papers, Don implies a positively charged Birkeland current. If we look back on the work that both Alvin and Peratt did on Birkeland currents, it is very obvious that they included both electrons and ions in their currents. In fact, if we examine the images taken from Peratt's work, this was from a dense plasma focus device and included both electrons and ions. Most plasmas in space will be a collection of both. Now this is not to say that electrons don't fit into a Bessel function model, it is just not explicitly mentioned. The question for me would be, would they form the same identical shells? Would these rotate in a different direction? Or do we assume that the electrons have more of a free role due to their size and speed? Okay, let's talk a little bit about Marklin convection. Now I've, I've done a video that details Marklin convection in a lot more detail. The basic principle is that charges will be drawn inwards in a filament if the magnetic field travels in the same direction as the current flow. Both the electrons and the ions move inwards, and as they move inwards, depending on the ionization potential of the different elements, they all become neutralized and the, the neutral material will diffuse outwards. So that's how you can get radial separation of the elements. So it works from the outside inwards. If we examine the Bessel function model, then you almost have the converse. The problem is that in, for Markland convection to work, then you would have to have the temperature at the center of the filament should be the lowest, and the highest should be on the outer edge. If we examine how the magnetic field changes in the Bessel function, we can see that it changes as we move further out from the center. And that's how we get these concentric rings and parts of the current flowing forward and parts of the current flowing backwards. The concept of Markland convection works because the charges are drawn towards the center due to the magnetic field, which is moving in the same direction as the current flow. But if the magnetic field is changing, then they would feel a force which would not always pull them towards the center. In fact, what should happen, based on the magnetic field changes in the Bessel function, is that there will be shells at which this material could move no further inwards or outwards due to the field reversals we talked about, due to the creation of these shells where the material simply orbits around the center. Now Don attempts to overcome this by pointing out that there is also a radial electric field from the outside to the inside. And again, this is because one of the things that you assume is that the highest current density would be at the center. So therefore you have the most charges at the center and therefore this will have the highest positive charge and as we move further out it decreases so therefore you have a voltage profile 
from the centre to the outside. The problem is that this will cause the charges that are flowing inside of the vessel function to feel an outward force, which is the opposite to what we expect for Marklin convection, which is that the charges are drawn inwards. Now it does mean that electrons, if they are attracted, will be drawn into this pipe and pull towards the center. So we can indeed see the concept of Markland convection occurring, but in reverse. Now there are two important points that this means, because if there is a radial electric field that pushes the charges outwards, it means that that center pipe, the, the right at the center of the Birkeland current, it is hollow because the charges will push each other apart and therefore effectively that the, the center of that filament is a shell in itself which is moving in the forward direction. The second problem is that because of the, the magnetic field not always pointing in the same direction, the Marklin convection will halt at particular points because the material will no longer be drawn further outwards. It will simply orbit around. And therefore the question is, do you still get the same temperature profile that you require in order for Marklin convection to take place? Is it possible that only some elements end up recombining to form neutral matter? Or are there specific areas where no Marklin convection can take place because there simply isn't enough temperature or the temperature is too high for the material that is available. This in itself uncovers a rather large problem with the current state of the Bessel function filament. It is incomplete. At the moment, if you read Don's paper, it is very elegant and lays out how and why the Bessel function filament would work. He compares it to some of the images that Peratt had captured of huge energy filaments he created in the lab. These filaments include both electrons and ions but Don's work so far has focused on the ion-only filaments. Don's work clearly matches what we see in the laboratory from Peratt's work in terms of some of the structures he has observed, the shells and the movement of the plasma to these shells. But his paper does not explicitly mention what happens to the electrons. Now that is not to say that this will not occur, but when we examine plasma in space, we know that it contains both electrons and ions mixed together. Conditions in the plasma determine if recombination can occur, and these include the electron temperature, think the speed that they move, compared to the ions. So in order for Marklin convection to take place, we must have both electrons and ions in order to have recombination to allow for the sorting by ionization potential. So this would either require electrons to still be present surrounding the filament, which is possible, they would be drawn into the ion stream and initiate recombination. But how would they follow the Bessel function filament? How would they move along those shells in the magnetic field? And how would they combat the radial electric field? Now, would they move in the opposite direction? But would they move at the same speed? Or would they collect a different radius? Or would the shell structures look differently because of the speed and mass difference? So this, for me, is another area that, that needs clarification. The model itself, I think, works, but we need to understand how Marklin convection would work in a, in a Bessel function model where the electrons have not really been discussed and where the electric field would actually combat the movement of the electrons, let alone the fact that the shells, the shell formation inhibits the movement of the plasma past some of these shells. And finally, Z-pinch effect. What is not clear is what happens to these shells during a Z-pinch. And again, remember that once you initiate a Z-pinch, you are no longer in uh, a force-free aligned current. The, the situation changes because the magnetic field is no longer pointing in the same direction as the movement of the charges, which is why they compress. There's an additional force being applied to them. The magnetic field has to change to cause this pinching effect, and this must therefore have an effect on the structure of the shells. Do they interact or do they expand due to this pinching? Does this affect where the material is drawn to? Now, technically, you could argue that this is outside of the Bessel function model itself because that is a force-free filament that you're looking at. 
But again, it's an area that we do need to look at, understanding how when a Z-pinch occurs, how those shells would change and how the behavior of the plasma changes helps us to understand how those structures behave when we examine them out in space. Now Don's model is a fabulous step forward towards understanding our universe better. Experimental evidence supports this concept of shell structure within the filament, but many questions still remain to be answered around how these behave in outer space, how and why they create pairs of twisting filaments, whether this is one of many different configurations for a Birkeland current, the extent of Markland convection that can take place, and how this model would work in a Z-pinch. I hope you found this a useful insight into our current understanding of a Bessel function model. If you enjoyed this video, I would really appreciate it if you left a like. If you are new to this channel, then, then welcome, please consider subscribing. And once again, a big thank you to all my Patreon supporters. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time. Thank <laughs> you.